A family house in Hertfordshire, and it's crawling with creatures, from mice to microbes. Some of it, though, surely must be wildlife free. No. Tonight, in the places you least want to find them, the creatures that will find you. We eat insects all the time. Beetles, grubs, lice. How many people these days tap a biscuit and wait to see if insects come out of it? I would have eaten it. There's about a dozen tops. The sponge may, in fact, be teeming with germs, which you are then going to spread around your body. Yeah, it absolutely stank. When you opened the cupboard, it absolutely stank. I mean, there was just mice everywhere. Nothing compares to being woken up in the middle of the night by scuttling. I lifted that bonnet and I just couldn't believe what I saw. Welcome back to the infested family home. It's late and the kids are fast asleep. Mum and Dad are still awake. Over the last few weeks, we've seen them live side by side with all sorts of bugs and creepy crawlies. You'd have thought they could be alone somewhere in the house. The shower, perhaps. Sadly, not. Within the shower system, there's these slimy layers if you take an area the size of, say, a one-pence piece, there would be millions, if not billions, of bacteria living there. Many of them are totally harmless. But there have been surveys that have reported the presence of the bacterium which causes Legionnaire's disease, a pneumonia-like illness, which can be very serious. When the shower has been switched on, if it's not been in use for a while, the force of the water whooshing by can force some of the bacteria to detach, and then it can actually be inside the little droplets of water, the mist that you can see when you're in the shower. And the bacteria are then going into our airways and towards the lung area, and they start to cause damage, and then the disease process begins. Fortunately, that's not likely to happen unless you're already very weak from another illness. But the shower head isn't the only source of microbes. Inside the holes in your sponge, there will be skin fragments, there will be grease, there will be hair, there will be fibres, and all these things can act as a food source for germs. Journey inside, and you can see evidence of Mum's last shower. Stuck to the branches of the sponge are fragments of her skin, like these ones, surrounded by bacteria. The way the microbes are moved around can be highlighted using special filming techniques. The bathroom is quite a warm environment, so the organisms can continue to survive and maybe also grow and increase in numbers within the sponge itself. Some bacteria can multiply every 20 minutes, and very, very quickly, we've got very, very large numbers present. If the sponge has been lying around for a few days in the warmth and wet, it may be harboring teeming, teeming millions of germs. When you squeeze the sponge over yourself and massage it all over your skin, you may be transferring these germs from the sponge onto you. A £500,000 home on a quiet muse in a sought-after part of London. The pride and joy of PR director Katie Rowan, who's lived here for 18 months. I had searched for a new house to live in for probably about three years. So, as you can imagine, I was absolutely over the moon to get a house like this, which is perfect for entertaining, for dinners, for drinks. Everybody that comes to my house here always says how lucky you are. And I often think, if only you knew. When the evening is over and the guests have gone, Katie is far from alone. I lie in bed at night and I can hear scuttling behind the walls, underneath the floor. Um, they were in the ceiling at one point. I mean, it's horrific. It's like something out of a horror movie. 
Katie's dream house is infested with mice. Every night now I, I put earplugs in because they wake me up. Nothing compares to being woken up in the middle of the night by scuttling, thinking that something's going to fall on your head or your hair or crawl in your ear or something horrific like that. So, a year ago, Katie called in a pest controller. I looked under the cupboard under the stairs. There was all dropped me in around her, her shoes. There was um, dead mice behind this immersion heater. You could smell it. It absolutely stunk. When you opened the cupboard, it absolutely stunk. There was a dead, dead mouse under there. There was mice droppings on top of the boiler. I mean, there was just mice everywhere. So where were they coming from? I'm sure there was a dead one under there because it was really stinking for ages. Tony laid bait which killed all the mice, except at the very back of the house, where they kept reappearing. We'd done um, the courtyard at the back. We were still getting a problem there. We'd done the bedroom. We were still getting a problem in there as well, which leaves only one explanation, that it could be the neighbours. The neighbours are the exclusive Portland hospital where anyone who's anyone has their babies. Tony and I worked out that my house here is the only ha house in the terrace uh, which shares party walls with the hospital, and that's where the mice were coming through from. Hence the sleepless nights, or not. The hospital said they were victims too, not the source. The mouse problem is endemic to this area because of the location above the underground. There is no evidence that we can find to demonstrate that the mice that are going into Katie's house are coming from the Portland. The nightly scuttling continued. When Tony visited the hospital, he found mouse droppings in storerooms. But whether or not the Portland is the source of Katie's infestation, she's had enough. I've lived with it now for over a year. I'm going to give it another few months, and if it's not sorted out, then, quite frankly, I'm, I'm just going to sell this place. Hi, Elizabeth, Hello. is it? Yes. Kevin Shawkill, pest control. All right. Right. Are we on the road again in Leeds with pest controller Kevin Moore. Over a quarter of his call-outs are to students. This time, their unlikely claim is that their kitchen is infested with crickets. Where about have you seen them? The problem is down there in the corner. In this corner here? And I think there's a few of them crawling around. Oh, right. Actually, it's not crickets. Oh, right. I okay. thought it were really strange that, you know. The crickets turn out to be beetles, but Elizabeth still isn't amused. Let's see where we are. Oh! <laughs> You'll actually see somewhere around here. I thought this was quite a new place, which is why we chose it, and um, chose it specifically not to have to live with such things. We didn't want to have bugs and things in our house. <laughs> These are larder beetles. They invade kitchens and live off scraps. It's just easy to do. It's basically just spraying it, and you can't mop your floor for 10 to 15 days. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, God, don't be shocked. <laughs> don't tell me you mop your floor. Oh, no, no, no. Mosh it once a week. Okay. Mop it once a week, but... Uh... Your floor's going to be a bit slippery and it's going to take about an hour to dry. So, just don't mop. food and that around? Yeah, your food's fine. It's all on your tops. I'm not spraying your tops at all. I'm merely concentrating on your bottom. OK. OK. I mean, bottom of your floor, that is. Yeah. OK. <laughs> not concentrating on your bottom as you're walking out. Sorry, that was the wrong word to say, wasn't it? It's been a long day, but it's about to get longer. A quick check under the hall carpet reveals the whole place is infested. Found some in your hallway as well, so I'm going to need to spray all your ground floor, uh, all right, this okay. carpet level. Okay. Is it OK? Is, it's not going to inconvenience you, is it, at all? We'll go, we'll go to the bottom. Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. It's itching already. I really am. I hate it. I don't know. We just don't want to be seen as smelly, scabby students, cos we're really not. Um, this place is dirty from other students. Oh. I want everyone to know that. <laughs> and now everyone does. Unfortunately for Kevin, though, one of the hazards of the job, apart from infestation by bugs, is infestation by students. So that room's not going to get done, unfortunately. I have to come back and spray that one when it cleans it up. 
But at least they won't have beetles in their kitchen anymore. Or will they? It could be worse than they think. They might even have them in their food. And so might you. We eat insects all the time. If you think there are 18 million, million, million individual insects on Earth, it's almost inconceivable that you would not be eating a small piece of an insect at some um, stage in your life. In the course of about 50 years, if you added up all the bits, all the tiny bits of insects, all the little legs, all the little heads, all the wings, you would fill a, a jar about this big with insect bits. But many of them we eat whole and alive, like cheese mites, for example, which love nothing more than some nice, sweaty cheddar. Mites are not insects. They are more closely related to spiders. They have eight legs, but they're very, very small, about half a millimetre or a pinprick in a piece of paper. They do produce a smell, although the smell of the cheese is the cheese's own smell. Some people say it's minty. Others say that it smells very, very sour. I had a boss years ago who said it smelt like a little boy who would peed his corduroy trousers. But we can guarantee that most people have eaten mites or mite remains sometime in their lives. So, if you've just had cheese with your dinner, here's what you may have eaten, magnified over 2,000 times by an electron microscope. The commonest insect in the pantry is actually the book louse. A big starch lover, which got its name devouring the glue in book bindings. Nowadays, it prefers your bread. In fact, infestations of book lice are becoming more and more common. If you keep the bread for a little bit longer than normal and it's in a bag where book lice can get in, because they don't chew through packaging, they get through the gaps, then you could well have book lice feeding on the bread. They come indoors by accident, but bread in a humid cupboard will tempt them to stay. One of the problems we have is that the younger stages of book lice are colourless. So unless you have remarkably good eyesight, you won't even see them. And it gets worse. After the break... You certainly wouldn't see the adults there because of the seeds and depressions in the biscuit. Plus, stowaways. I'm extremely lucky, really, that it hasn't burst into flames and caused serious injury to somebody. At this infested house, lunch is becoming less appetising by the mouthful. Nematodes are very, very fine worm-like creatures, usually colourless, thread-like, uh, they have no distinguishing features at all, uh, possibly five to ten millimetres in length. They're invertebrates that live in the soil, almost always affecting the roots of plants. So the nematode could well be present in the leaves of the lettuce we eat. Delicious. And how do you fancy a few of these on your biscuits? They're the caterpillars of the Indian meal moth, and you might think they're unmissable. Although you would see the larger larvae and the adults, you certainly wouldn't see the tiny larvae. And their breeding rate is about 50-fold increase per month. So you can end up with a massive infestation within two or three months. The droppings, which are called frass, uh, that's the technical word for insect poo, they will be spread across the biscuits. Uh, you can't brush that off easily. And although you might not mind eating insects, you don't want to eat the droppings necessarily. And then there's the sawtoothed grain beetle, magnified here 350 times. It's partial to this sort of thing. You certainly wouldn't see the adults there because of the seeds and depressions in the biscuit. And in that case, we've got an even higher breeding rate. If you start off with 100 beetles, in a month's time, you've got about 6,000. And in two months' time, if everything went well for the beetles, you'd have over a third of a million. I mean, how many people these days tap a biscuit on the table and wait to see if insects come out of it. Nobody does that. But sailors did until the 1800s to check for beetles in ships' biscuits. Perhaps Dad should have taken a leaf out of their book, then he might have spotted these. Bon appétit. Having recently got back together, Chris was cooking me dinner and I was down for the weekend just to see his new house, where he was living and whether he changed or not. It was kind of an important meal, really, just because, you know, we were getting back together and we were talking, and so the meal was, you know, building up to this evening that we were going to have this long chat. Well, the pasta in the pan was boiling away quite nicely, and I noticed all these small brown things coming up to the surface. She was saying, oh, the weevils, the weevils, and I said, no, they're fine. 
They're fine, you know, it'll be fine. It's boiling so hot that it won't infect food. It just looked absolutely disgusting. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know where they'd come from, but they were sitting there in the pasta and there was just no way I was going to touch the stuff. I would have eaten it um, because there would have been... There's about a dozen tops. I don't know what it is about women. Maybe we just notice things a little bit more than men. Every December, outside this house near Romford in Essex, Tony Old and his son decorate the Christmas tree with lights. Every year, except 1999, that is. Up in the garage loft, Tony found his Christmas tree lights weren't how he left them last year. To my amazement, all the bags had been chewed up. I'd little pieces of wire and bulbs everywhere all up in the loft, been chewed to pieces. Mice. And as Tony was about to discover, they had bigger plans, much bigger plans. He and his wife own his and hers BMWs worth a total of £50,000. But to a mouse, these are no more out of bounds than Christmas tree lights. The following morning, me and my wife was going shopping. And while we were driving along, I noticed the fuel gauge light was on. And with filling the car up, the light stayed on. So I booked the vehicle into um, the local BMW garage. We found that the problem was the wiring to the fuel sender, which is actually located inside the car, underneath the back seats. It had been completely chewed through. But at least the other car, Tony's prized 2.8 litre 3 Series convertible, was in one piece. The following morning, I've gone out to go to work and got in my car and gone to start it and it wouldn't start. I lifted up the bonnet and I just couldn't believe what I saw. Whatever it was, it actually chewed clean through the alarm wiring, which had basically caused the car to stop. It had also chewed through various other sensor and coolant sensor and air pressure temperature sensor and God only knows what. On closer examination, underneath the inlet manifold, there was a nest, which included a cigarette packet, cotton wool, ears of corn, all sorts of things. Assembled by daredevil death-defying mice. I was just totally amazed that animals could live in an engine which is being driven along two or three times a day, every day. It was extremely lucky in both cases, really. Uh, the wiring uh, cuts could have really affected a fire in both of the cars, which would have been catastrophic for him. For some, just being infested is catastrophic enough. Pest controller Matt Wheeler sees it all the time. Hello. Pest control. Oh, About these cluster flies. Hmm? About these cluster flies. Yeah. Is there no light up here, Mrs. No, Wheeler? I told you there wasn't. Pardon? I warned you that there wasn't. What, what, was the pro what did you see? What was the problem? Flies. Valerie McRae believes a dead bird in her loft two years ago attracted an infestation of flies and that they might be back. Have you been getting them falling out of the loft, Mrs McRae? Well, they fly around the house, but also the this, this little bedroom here gets quite a few. I picked up about four from the floor only the other day. Matt, what do you look for when you're looking for cluster flies? Clusters of flies? Oh, hang on, we might be getting some joy over here. After... Yeah, there are flies up here. I wonder where they're clustering. Aha, bingo. Found them. Yeah, having a full on disco over here. Cluster flies hibernate in lofts over the winter. They find each other by smell and cluster together for protection. The more flies there are, the stronger the smell in the loft and the more likely they are to return. It's the pheromone lure which draws them back to the same place. Hence, some people are unlucky, they have a They'd have a problem with cluster flies year in, year out, every other year, depending on weather. And neighbours don't get any of those problems at all. Have any of your neighbours had any cluster fry? No idea. It's not the thing you talk about to neighbours anyhow, is it? I'm disgusted. It's not very nice, is it? It makes it sort of look as though it's not clean, isn't it? No matter who you are, you know, you could be landed gentry living in some huge country manor, or you can be in the middle of Marsh Farm Luton. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, pests are no respect of person. It's not your fault that you've got cluster flies in your loft. Yeah. It's just, just one of them things. Well, I'm just going to get up there and get this thing blitzed anyway. It'll only take me a couple of minutes. 
Matt fumigates Valerie's loft, but he may well be back, because so may the flies. Over the last few weeks, this house has been the scene of damage and disease, bites and contamination. You'd be forgiven for thinking your home is a chamber of horrors. But there are two sides to every story. Finally, time for the other side. Insects are a part of our natural environment, and it's very important for us to appreciate that we shouldn't go out there trying to kill everything. Even within your home, you can actually achieve a sort of comfortable balance of nature. For example, spiders, on the whole, are extremely beneficial in houses. Um, they are your friends, and if you kill them, you take away the one organism that can actually take away some of the things that pose a risk as far as disease transmission is concerned. I don't think eating any of these insects is a cause for concern. I don't mean we make a habit of it, but the risk to the human, the risk to us when we're eating them is probably negligible. The beetles and the moths are simply an additional form of protein and roughage, and maybe we should think of them like that. The bacteria that we most come into contact with fall into the good guy category. They perform a very useful role. Lots of bacteria have the ability to take lots of our waste products and they degrade those. Others of the good guys are used in antibiotics, pharmaceuticals, medicines that we need in society. Flies are actually quite useful. Um, although we think of them as a real nuisance, if it weren't for things like blue bottles, um, corpses of rats or any other animal uh, would lie around an awful lot longer and smell an awful lot more than in fact they do. Um, because, because of the action of maggots, they're quickly disposed of and recycled into new living material, the flies. I get very aggravated by the general response to insects, to bugs, creepy crawlies, uh, and that reaction is generally, ugh, horrible, oh, creepy crawly, you know, ooh. If you understand how an insect lives, if you know how it lives, if you can see how it lives and how it feeds, how it breeds, it becomes interesting. It's not an alien anymore. And when things are not alien, you aren't afraid of them.